interviewed this woman yesterday who is a sex coach and therapist. And I wanted Not to share. Not at all up your wheelhouse. <laughs> Not at all. I, you know what? I, I got, it was a pitch from a publicist and I usually don't take those. And, but I was so intrigued. I was so intrigued by, like, publicist wasn't even that great of a pitcher. But I was like, <laughs> that didn't sound right. <laughs> wow. And I hope they're not listening right now. Oh, my God. Well, I kind of said it when I interviewed this woman. I'm like, the pitch was okay. I'm like, but I was just so intrigued by the content. That's what got my attention, right? So it's kind of an interesting conversation. Gosh, has the show started already? Maybe I should start it. Hey, everyone, welcome to another episode of The Women Your Mother Warned You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy and Sales Gravy University. And when my fractional co-host shows up, sometimes we just start the show and I forget to start the show. She says, I've got some ideas for you, Jeff. I was talking to a sex therapist yesterday. Yep, my wife, my kids, my mom, my family, everyone is going to be happy to listen to this. It didn't go exactly like that, but Good morning, Gina. I might be paraphrasing a little bit, but it's pretty close. And see how that could be taken. Treating me like a piece of meat again. That's Here we go. Here we go. Coffee with the two of us. Yeah. I yeah, I guess it always comes back to treating you like a piece of meat. I'm sorry. Sorry, not sorry. What I was trying to say. I'm used to it by now. It's okay. I, I know you are. It was worse when I had the other female co-host. And now there's just me. So it's just one-on-one -on -one versus. Anyway. <laughs> 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 It's all right. I miss you so much. I, I don't even have to say anything. <laughs> There's a sales lesson here, I think. Just let your prospects keep talking. Get them to keep talking until they hear themselves say that thing out loud that they needed to hear themselves <laughs> say. And yeah. And there you go. Oh my God. There you go. So anyway, sales lessons doing when people pitch to have mm -hmm. their client as a guest on the show like i just usually ignore those because i get so Me many too. bad pitches of like you should listen to you should have my blah, blah, blah. and it's like all the same people being pitched same type of people well and i don't take many of those pitches actually i don't take any anymore unless maybe there's maybe they're pitching me someone that I know. And mm -hmm. then it's like, then I'll call my friend and be like, you don't have to pay somebody to get on my show. You could just call me. Right. We know each other, but I don't take very many guests on my show. Like it's very rare that I take guests. It's less than it might be 15, 20% of the, the episodes have an interview component to them. Uh, of my current show. And I, so I know I have, I haven't been on it. So yeah. yeah. Well, no. And I don't like <laughs> when there's something that I think you'll be perfect for that comes <laughs> up, then I will ask you, but like this season I've got, I think 28 episodes scheduled or 30 episodes scheduled and like four interviews and they're very specifically placed. And I just don't have that kind of show. So when someone pitches uh, their guest for my show, it's like, oh yeah, no, you there's, there's no way they could be perfect for my show because you haven't ever really paid attention to my show. You don't know what I'm trying to do or right. why. And I have a hard time. I don't want to say I have a hard time saying no. I'm trying to have a little bit of compassion toward salespeople to say, look, here's why it's not a good fit. It's not that your client isn't awesome. It's That's not how my show works. I really don't know what to tell you. And then they'll bring me back another one a week later, and it's like, okay, now you're starting to offend me because I actually responded to you. And I know most people don't respond to you, but I actually responded to you. Will you please stop? Yeah, it's that is, I think, a big problem with the outreach today. And we're going to see more and more of it as these tools become more automated and more intelligent to disguise their automation. But just pay attention. I'm not asking you to do a whole lot of homework on me. What I'm saying is if you're going to say that my show is perfect for your client or your client is perfect for my show, 
at least know what you're saying. Well, again, yeah, it's, it's sales 101, and I've kind of felt this way in, for the last five years that I've been doing this show of all the pitches I get, of all the pitch slapping I get, right? They're publicists. They don't see themselves as salespeople, but they are salespeople because they're trying to sell their client into a show and they're doing all the wrong things, all the stereotypical bad things a, sale, a bad salesperson does of like spray and pray. Let me throw out this large net and see if you, I can get my person on the show. And oftentimes, you definitely have way more compassion than I do for salespeople, for sure, because I'm the one who will be like, I will coach them back on their bad pitches because I do want to help them. And I'm annoyed at the same time because, especially like you said, if they, when they keep coming back, and I'm like, okay, I've already basically told you I'm not a fit. I'm trying to help you out and tell you I'm not a fit. Same with the podcast. Or when they're like, our guest would be, our client would be such the perfect guest. Or I've heard your show and it's such an amazing show. And those other pitches of like, let me sell you all the services to support a podcaster because there's a million of those too, pitching. Mm -hmm. And I usually go, awesome. What was your favorite episode and why? <laughs> and then they never respond again. Interesting. <laughs> Isn't that actually, interesting? I actually had one person respond. And he said, uh, this was a couple of years ago. And he said, Hey, I, I've been looking at your blog. I've been listening to your podcast and I, I think we'd be able to help you, blah, blah, blah. And I said that and I said, so what did you like about it? And they responded within like 10 minutes, like so quickly that I know they didn't say, oh shoot. And then have to go and do right, the right, research right, right. or whatever, yeah. rattled off like six, seven bullet points, told me what those things were, told me what they meant to him. And I'm like, okay, when do you want to talk? I got to drive in like two days. I was driving up north. I'm like, I'm sitting in my car for the next three hours. Can't guarantee cell signal the entire way, but like, here's my window, what you got. And we talked for a while and it wasn't a good fit, but good salesmanship gets rewarded when you reach out to me. And this was really good process, really good technique. So yeah, I, I will. I'm not, I am not someone who just rejects all outreach. But I will say with the increase in bad outreach, the good stuff needs to stand out a little more. And I, I think it just means that we all need to sharpen our games a little bit. Well, and it's almost easy to it's almost easy to do that because, like you said, there's so much bad outreach that just elevating your game a tiny bit mm -hmm. actually makes you look I, I talk about this in customer service too a lot when I do customer service training. Like we're so we're so waiting for bad customer service. We expect bad customer service so that when we actually get decent subpar service, it's all like, wow, that was amazing. You said hello and thank you. I'm like, thank oh. You greeted me when you brought when you came to my table in a restaurant. Like that's the world we've come to that I'm just excited <laughs> that you said hello to me. I had an experience yesterday with a bank and we got locked out, the, the online bank, we got locked out because the password manager had some bad information or something between my wife and I, we timed out, right? So mm. I said, you got a call. I'm like, ugh. Been there. I called, someone picked up, <laughs> went through the automated messaging, right? For the menu. Couple of touches on the keypad. Someone answered. It was a real person. They said, what's the problem? And I told them, I said, oh yeah, that happens. All right. We can reset you this way or we can reset you this way. How would you like to do it? I was on the phone for a total of like five minutes and I was back in and it was so simple. It wasn't, there was enough security. It's not like they bypassed all the security, but immediately they picked up and said they knew who I was because my phone number, they knew what I was trying to do. They heard my story. They didn't read me some long three page legal disclaimer about what they needed to do and why I needed to do it and blah, blah, blah. It was just, oh, okay. And then I was ready to roll. It was like, that was, this person did nothing extraordinary because nothing extraordinary was required. It was just simple, straight to the point. And that, st that stood out to me as a phenomenal customer experience. Like to your point, you don't have to do much to stand out. You just exactly. need to be a little bit purposeful, be 
kind and be present. I think that was it too. They weren't buried in a manual of things to say. This woman could keep her head where her feet were and just answer my questions and help. <laughs> that was it. And the other thing I see in this, just like the person who called you and was able to tell you what they liked about the show, like mm -hmm. that, both of these scenarios, some of it too also includes pre being prepared, like actually being prepared or understanding what you're selling or servicing on, right? Oh yeah, that happens, right? Right. Like that's what the bank, the banker said. I've got the same experience with our bank and I purposely intentionally chose a local bank, right? They might have some other branches in the state, but they are primarily a local bank. And when my husband and I got married, he was with a big national bank and we were moving him over to mine, which was sort yeah. of not an argument, but I'm like, I'm not moving because all of my business accounts were at that bank. And I'm like, I, I'm like, I'm not moving all my business accounts. <laughs> See, it wasn't an argument. I just said, I'm not moving. And then he came to me. <laughs> That's <laughs> And I must sound terrible. <laughs> no, that's not terrible. No, actually, no, that, that doesn't sound terrible at all. It was just funny the way that laid out. If you were to go back and read the transcript, it says, and it wasn't an argument. I just said, I'm not moving. That's funny. There's a line in the sand right there. <laughs> Marriage is about compromise in many situations. And you like who you choose your battles for the sake of your relationship. And we can say that in sales too of like, all right, what here needs to happen? And when I laid out, the, I'm like, listen, if we move to your bank, which, and I want to get to optimization because you talked about that a couple of days sure. ago, we could have moved to his bank that technology wise was better. And all of those things, right? It's just better from that standpoint. But because I've got business accounts and I didn't want to have to like move them and get my articles of incorporation. And when you do that with yeah. a business account in a bank, like I just didn't want to do that. I've done it a couple of times. And like, I just want to keep it here because I've got my whole history of banking there. Can we just stay? Can we please stay? Come over to my bank. No, we're, I'm not moving, right? So he comes over and we add him in. And he was frustrated in the beginning because he had to make the change, right? Think about a customer who's got to make the change. Oh, yeah. He was frustrated with it because their technology is not the best on all the things. We are now digitally, electronically depositing because he's like, what century are you in? Like, are you not? Why are you not depositing? <laughs> I'm like, I drive to the bank and I deposit it. He's like, why? It's so... I let him handle the bank accounts now, now that he, oh. like, so, so now, not only am I not moving, but now they're your problem. Congratulations. Here you go. This is Married Life with Gina Tremarco. You should start a podcast with your husband and call it Married Life with Gina Tremarco. And just talk about all the, <laughs> quote, battles you choose not to pick. That's, that's what we need to do. Or funny you should say that because I've joked with him about it. I'm like, we should start a podcast because he's so funny. He is mm -hmm. like, he is so funny and he's so sarcastic. And together we're like, oh, like Lucy and Ricky, but he's not Hispanic. So it's like, it is that kind of relationship where mm -hmm. we're just busting on each other. And at some point, one of us is the dumb one, right? Like one of us is like... Not smart about something. For any of you watching or listening at home, can you guess which one of those two is the dumb one more often than the other? Just a quick little straw poll. Tap one on your phone if you think it's. <laughs> he, will, he will say to me, he's like, how are you so successful in your career when you can't do <laughs> fill in the blank? <laughs> he goes, I just don't get it. I go. Yeah, but you really thought I was something before you tricked me. <laughs> I was able to pull you into the web. He's like, how did you get through life? And I'm like, I found a way. And now, anyway, so this bank, similar to yours, I can pick up the phone, call them, no matter which branch, because like, there are three branches in our area. Mm -hmm. They all know me. Shocking. It's a well, small you show up. 
every Tuesday morning <laughs> with a stack of checks that you hand sign. Do you bring cookies with you too? Do you bring that lasagna that you've been threatening to make for me for five years? Well, which reminds me, I'm going to tell you a story about a toaster and this bank. So this <laughs> it gets better. So anyway, they are so good. I'm going to do a shout out to them, at CCNB in Myrtle Beach. They are so good because they do. They actually pick up the phone. There's actually no automation. Like someone actually answers the yeah. phone, and I say, "Hey, it's Gina Tremarco. I'm." Because we get locked out of our password too. And like, oh, I'm like, I, for some reason I can't access or I can't see this account. And similar, like, oh, yeah, that sometimes happens. Okay, hold on a second. We're going to reset everything. And yeah. then can you just hold on one second? I'm like, yeah. And they come back. Yeah, try it now. Oh, yep, I'm in. Okay, great. Anything else you need? And it's, I know, that's why I stay with them. Because I know if I have any kind of problem, they literally take care of it in minutes mm -hmm. and it is why would i ever leave them technology what? not the best no offense but customer service consistent can count on them it, and what do you want though like okay so the technology is not the best so they don't have a fancy app okay they've got the app but like they're when we pay stuff through the account it's not as smooth. It's a little clunky. That's all. Yeah. It's just yeah. a little clunky. And, and we have the same thing. We make, you make sacrifices, you make compromises based on what's really important to you. And we bank, the, the bank I was talking about earlier was actually a big bank because we had a, a line of credit through that for the business and all that. But we do our regular banking through a credit union, financial institution. It's a really big credit union, but we like the fact that they're not tied to an investment bank. Right. We like the fact that at our local branch, if we went in every Tuesday with a stack of checks, they would know who we are. We, we do know when we go in there, it might be a couple of times a year. We got to go in to open a new account for the kids or do something. And people recognize us. They remember the stories that we've told. That's important to us. Right. Now, there are some things that with a credit union, when I have an international client, I have to jump through hoops in order to get paid. I don't like that, but that doesn't happen all that often. Most of my right. clients are domestic. So it's just, we occasionally put up with some BS, but by and large, we just love who we work with and how. And that's just, that's the thing. There is no one best fit for everybody. Right. And I right. think salespeople, if we tie this back to another sales lesson, it's understand who you are, understand who you're not. And find the people who care who you are. Find the people who want to do business with someone who does fill in the blank, even though they don't list these things over, fill in your list of things over here. And finding that fit is how you create raving fans. Um, well, you hit on something really important. Like, like what, what is important to me when it comes yeah. to banking with that bank? And I think as, as a sales lesson, we have to identify what's important to that prospect, to that client. I might not be able to check everything on your box, but he, what's the most important thing to you? How do we like, how do we understand that? So we might not be a good fit for you, but if I'm a good fit for you out of nine out of 10 things, anybody else is going to be in the same scenario or won't be as good of a fit as we are. And you probably still win if you're a fit for seven out of 10. Right. Six out of 10. If, well, but I think, and I don't want to split hairs with you, Gina, but what I mean is I think if people think that they have to be nine out of 10, then all of a sudden it discourages yeah. Yeah. them from recognizing that the bar's not actually that high. Well, you have to weight those things, right? So, mm -hmm. so the seven out of 10, if one through five is 80% important, then six and seven, right? Or six mm -hmm. through 10, that's the other thing looking at I, I know this isn't sales but yeah exactly i find myself <laughs> right i'm sure you do too i find myself in life falling into sales strategies constantly and i get called out for it for sure so we just my husband and i just got around to planning a honeymoon we haven't had one and he put it he's like well, i thought you were gonna aren't you gonna take care of it take care of it and i'm like fine he's like you're the traveler and i'm like fine so we going through this process of figuring it out. And he kept saying, I want to go to 
Cayman Islands. I want to go to Cayman Islands. I want to go to Cayman Islands. And I'm like, so I did all my Caribbean research. I do like major, re- I'm like, uh, airfare. When can we both go based on our schedules? Like, what's the fit on all those things? And airfare was crazy to the Caribbean, but that's really where you want to go. And then I thought, well, maybe we'll go to Europe. I went down all these rabbit holes. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'll go to Europe. I, we really only have this one week period. Well, I don't want to go to Europe for a week. I'd rather go for two weeks. And maybe Europe's not the, I'm like, I right, just make a decision, Gina, just choose something. Right. So I said to him, because all the research I did, I've been to Cayman coming off of a cruise. Mm-hmm. Cayman is described as like kind of the concrete jungle. It's a bunch of tall buildings and hotels. And I'm like, that didn't feel very beachy to me. And I live at the beach. So I finally go to him and I go, so why Cayman? What is so important? Like, why does Cayman matter to you? And I'm mm. like, oh, my God, I am such a sales person. <laughs> I was trying to get the why behind the why. I'm like, why Cayman? And he's like, well, I went on a cruise once. I'm like, we all did. And I went swimming with the stingrays in the stingray alley. And I'm like, so have I. Okay. He's like, I want to do that. And I'm like, so it's the stingrays. He's like, yeah. I'm like, anything else about Cayman? He's like, no, I've never really been there. I'm like, (laughs) okay. Right. Think about how this shows up with our prospects, right? Like we got to dig a little bit deeper. I'm like, it's just it's the stingrays so i do a search i google top places for stingrays and of course cayman comes up and somewhere in europe comes up but in the top five the two caribbean places that came up in the top five in the world were cayman and antigua i'm like all right what if we go to antigua so i start doing all this antigua research and then long story short we're going to antigua But I I got beneath the surface of what was something that would be important to him that he'd really like to do and why he kept coming back to this. We got to go to Cayman. Everything is sales. That was my story. But everything is sales. Parenting is sales. Parenting is management in a way too. But why do you want that? What do you want? Okay. Why do you want that? Oh, so this is what you're trying to accomplish. And this is the way you think you can accomplish it. All right. Well, what if I could show you one, two, three, four, nine other ways to accomplish that might be less expensive, might be more expensive, but would also have these other potential benefits, outcomes, benefits yeah. as well. Now we can start to see a, a bigger picture. When you can start to paint a bigger picture for your prospects, for your clients, they start to look at you differently, not just what they're buying or looking to buy, but they start to look at you as someone who can help them decide on what they should do. That's the path to becoming a trusted advisor. And that's funny. I was just recording some episodes for my podcast about discovery. And I'd like to say that most salespeople hurry through the discovery process so they can get to the selling part. They Mm -hmm. forget that discovery is the selling part. Right, right. Discovery, when you're asking those questions about that potential, about those opportunities, about their motives, about what they're trying to accomplish, about why they want to accomplish it, about what happens when you accomplish it, what happens if you don't accomplish it, what what becomes possible when you reach this state, when you can start to think two, three, four orders of magnitude away from where they are right now and paint that bigger picture, you create the space where you can ask the question about, okay, what becomes possible when we paint this picture, right? You you start to figuratively wrap your arm around your prospect's shoulder and look off into the horizon and daydream together. And that's what really good professional B2B, at least, discovery looks like. And most people never get there because they're worried about whether or not the prospect has the budget and the authority and the need and the timeline to do this right now. And if you don't want to do this right now, well, then I got to call somebody else because my manager expects a number by the end of the month. And it's, it's so short-sighted. Yeah, I was just going to say, why do you think, like, we could preach all day long. I agree with you on the discovery. I think that's one of my strong points. Why, no matter how much preaching and teaching we do on it, really, what holds people back from doing effective discovery? Is it because we need a deal now? It's because we feel like we need a deal now, but it is more the fact that We believe that selling should be distilled to a science and that most people believe that there is a perfect set of things to say. You're trying to say the perfect thing to the perfect person at the perfect time. 
And that is not only unreasonable, it's just ridiculous. So I, I say those two things, right? We need results now. And we think that there is a magic combination to unlock. And sellers are afraid to get vulnerable. They're afraid to show that they're not the expert, forgetting that you demonstrate expertise by being willing to be vulnerable in the space with your clients. And I know that fits into improv and all the stuff that you do around improv too, but like we forget that in order to connect with your prospect, in order to give them that level of comfort, that feeling of connection with you, you have to let your guard down a little bit. Otherwise you run a very high risk of being seen as bossy or controlling or domineering. And you, you want to have the authority to be able to guide the conversation, to be able to guide the sale. But in order to earn that authority, you have to show that you have a soft spot as well, and that you're right. seeking to understand. Curiosity is a huge portion of discovery, and you can't be curious unless you're willing mm -hmm. to be wrong. And that is the opposite of being a know-it-all, right? So these two things are in conflict with one another. Should I get vulnerable? Do I need to get vulnerable? Yeah, yeah but I also have to be an expert. Doesn't that mean I have to have all the answers? No, no. that's where people, I think, are led astray. And then when you layer that over the idea that, well, I'm supposed to know exactly what to do every time and I am supposed to push this process through so that I can repeatedly hit a number, it just doesn't work that way. And so I've always taken the approach that you have to get yourself enough at bats and you have to create enough yeah. opportunities for yourself to win so that you don't have to win 33.3% of them in order to hit your number. Right. If you close about a quarter of your deals, then you should open up. If you need to, if you close a quarter of your deals and you need to close two deals a month, well, then you know you need to close, you need to open at least eight deals. Well, what I would say is then get yourself involved in 12 to 15 deals mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that even on the low end of things, you still close your two. And if a couple of things go your way, maybe you close six. Like, I can't control which ones are going to close and which ones aren't. I'm just going to make sure I'm involved in enough to wherever things fall, I'm going to be okay. And that's not hard and fast science, but I like selling. So I just keep selling. And that's what puts me in those positions, right? Well, that's it's a combination of the process and the, and I read something that you wrote about writing it down and having the process, right? We have to mm -hmm. have the process. But we have to be able, that's where the improvising comes in. We have to flex in the process. Yeah. And so I, I, what I, like I see is, said that. Pe what, 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 where I see people get stuck is that um, they have the process and then they don't know how to flex in the process or they do too much flexing and don't have a process and they have to have a happy medium. And I'm sure you see this too. I, I've, heard, I've heard sales leaders say this and getting ready to train their team. Well, product knowledge is a really big problem for them. Some of our newer people are having product knowledge issues and that's what's slowing them down on selling. And I'm like, okay, I I'm quite not under, I see your face. I'm like, I get it, right? And product knowledge does help with confidence in selling. I, I, now I'm speechless just as you're speechless because my inside voice is like, okay, well, what are you doing to help them with that? What are you doing? Because I, when I don't feel confident enough about what I'm selling, because I don't know all the things, especially like I knew sales and training and coaching when I joined Sales Gravy, but I didn't know Sales Gravy. So I had to learn the process with them and how they do things. And then when I didn't know something, I'd be like, hey, Jeb, can you help me with this? <laughs> like, I don't know. It's kind of common sense-ish to me. Your thoughts, because your face was saying everything. I'm trying to think of something that'll be a buzzy catch line for <laughs> to promote this podcast episode, but I'm going to try too hard and just blow it. Here's the thing. Product knowledge is probably the least valuable training that you're going to get. Unless you're in a strictly transactional B2C process, but that's not your audience. That's not my audience. It's yeah. not where we live. So there are places where product knowledge is paramount and you need to know it so you can pitch it. Cool. But you, you don't win B2B sales with product knowledge. You win B2B sales with conversations. And I've got a question for you here. 
Gina, how do you start a conversation? How do I start? Like, which conversation? Doesn't matter. Any with conversation. Any, with anybody. I mean, it de depends on the scenario. Am I cold no, calling? Am I in a, it, it, am no, I in a meeting? Am I? Doesn't matter. You start a conversation by asking a question. You end a conversation by making a statement. So you, I, I see where you, you're going now. You're on, I wanted to let you off the hook. I, I didn't mean to, it's early in the morning. I didn't mean to catch it's you not, off guard there. The, I just needed more details. That's all. Yeah. Uh, well, but here's the thing. I would argue that you don't need any details. Okay. You start a conversation you by asking a question on a cold call. You ask a question in an email. You ask a question. Maybe you introduce yourself first, but before you give your a prospect a chance to speak, you ask them a question, especially on a call. If you're using a permission-based opener, do you, do you mind if I steal a minute of your time? Do you have 27 seconds to hear a bad pitch from a worse salesperson? Do you have like whatever, all these yeah. pattern interrupts, I hear what you openers, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, but when you want to start something meaningful, you ask a question. Right. Who's I hear you. Yeah. bank would you like to use? It's really not a question. There's already an answer to that question. We knew that, but, but like in a B2B sales motion, you start conversations by asking questions. You you want to ask convert or you want to ask questions about the prospect's position and not their, like their job title, but what's their current state? What do they want to accomplish? Right, right, right. What do they think is getting in their way? What would happen if we remove those barriers for them? I've got to have at least a sales call, maybe even two, before I can make a product recommendation. Cor correct. Right. So, 100%. so why do I need all this product knowledge to sell? And if discovery is the selling part, right? Now, a little bit of product knowledge will inform the questions that you can ask. But I had a conversation uh, with a client yesterday. They said, all right, Jeff, we're, and they just finished an engagement with me. And this really wasn't covered in the engagement, but they said, we've got to hire a few reps. What should the onboarding process look like? What's the first 90 days? So I ran through a checklist of some things. And then I said, I don't know, by the third, fourth week, get them on the phone. Get them asking questions, getting them, get them starting conversations. Like, I don't know if you have to map that out or if you just need to, at some point, set them free and see what kind of trouble they can cause, right? What kind of a ruckus they can make. And you don't have to arm them with all the scripts in the world. You just need to give them an understanding of to what are, uh, as to rather, what are the problems that they're, that you're capable of solving and have them start conversations around that. You'll learn the product knowledge as you go. And you certainly need to give them a little bit of training and an overview. But you know, when you drink from the fire hose that they shoot at you during onboarding and during initial training, orientation rather, there's only so much that's going to stick. You need some context as to why that information right. is valuable. And that's where real field reps, rep, by reps, repetitions in this case, yeah, yeah, getting yeah. your reps in, that's where that's helpful and valuable. Yeah. I like it. Thanks. I do. <laughs> but like product knowledge is just so overvalued that when I have a manager say, yeah, they need better product training. It's like, oh yeah, you don't really understand a thing about what's going on your team. Yeah. Well, and I think some of them are also sharing it with me, meaning they're not confident in what they're doing because they don't know the product as well. And I've had to coach those leaders on, all right, well, what can you do to continue to, you've got to cheerlead and promote them that, like everything you just said, that's not as important. Let's focus on the conversations, right? Like when you said, what's the, usually when I'm have when I'm asking the question, I always disguise it in the tell me more statement right, of using that as a question. And I usually start most of my conversations with, tell me what's going on in the business right now. Mm -hmm. Like I, I just do a blanket, very simple, generic, and they will tell me for the next 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to ask a lot of questions because like, that's my style from the improv piece of it. The irony of the improv is that when we first start training, the regular Joe who takes classes, which we're back up and running now after three That's years. Right. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. And so anybody can sign up for those classes. And, and one of the things we teach the average Joe or Jennifer is that do not ask a lot of questions on stage because the constant questions on stage slows down the momentum 
of creating something together and collaborating. And people are already uncomfortable getting up there trying to to improvise an idea without a script. And you're going to slow them down with the question. And actually, we have this prompt. We call it, I only ask because. So when they catch themselves in a question, like, what are you doing here, Jeff? And the other performer's like, now Jeff's got to answer that, right? And Jeff's like already in his head, like, I'm, right? And so what I've taught them is every time you catch yourself, and it's beautiful to watch because it happens every time, because in the first couple of classes, I'm like, question, that was a question, Mm -hmm. right? I side coach them. And so now they go, oh, what are you doing up here, Jeff? Oh, I only ask because it looks like, right? And it gets them to get into this other mindset of like making a statement so that we can build something together. It's the yes and piece of it. Right. Of being cognizant of, let's not ask too many questions. We can ask one question or give it or say, tell me more about this that makes them feel like, oh, I want to learn more about you. Tell me more. And now I'm not in so much of an interrogation, but that's my initial approach in discovery is like I'm building rapport and trying to get to know you before I ever get into if we should be working together. Well. You need to know what you're potentially getting into. What if this isn't someone you want to work with? What if this isn't someone you can help? What if they they have a problem that you just can't solve? I, I think one of the biggest mistakes that most sales, one of the biggest superstitions that most salespeople fall prey to is this idea that everybody is a potential customer and you should have something for everyone. And it yeah, no. It wasn't until I started giving myself permission to drive by the office of, in this case, orthopedic surgeons. Every orthopedic surgeon could buy something from me, but there were some people that I knew just never would because their motives just didn't align with my value proposition. And it took me a long time. You you drive by the exit on the freeway, you're like, oh, I'd go to that office if I get off right here. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't have to. As a matter of fact, it would be a waste of time for me to do that. So this superstition that you should be prepared to sell something to anybody at any time. I think causes a lot of anxiety and I think that gets in the way Mm -hmm. of a lot of people. And it's okay to say no. You never have a better day in sales than when you fire your worst customer. I suggest that you try not to hire any of those, that you try not to find any of those. It's, yeah, it that kind of pressure, just ask the question to see where the conversation goes. Be curious. And I'm curious to, to you, do you ever literally say yes and to your clients in discovery? Oh, God, all the time. Okay. Like literally, yeah. It's so part of my vernacular, which is so funny because when I use it in training, because I always add the yes and component in sales training. And in the very beginning, they're like, I oh, we would never talk this way. It's so weird. I'm like, all right, let me know how that goes in a week. And they always come back to me with, Oh, we've been yes anding in the office all week. Once they get into the habit of it, it's so funny to me every time, especially the analytical ones who are like, this just doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, I know it doesn't make any sense. It's like riding a bike for the first time with training wheels. It feels really weird. I'm like, just trust the process on this, right? Because what that yes and does in so many ways is just the word yes gets people's attention. But if you follow that yes with a but, then you lose them. If you follow that yes with an and, it disrupts because they're like, oh, so expecting you to but me. Oh, where's the but? There's no but. And now they're totally off because they're Mm -hmm. not expecting the and piece of it. So I use yes and as an objection turnaround technique because it's how I slow my brain down of like, yes, the price is higher than you thought it would be. And I can take my time in how I respond to it Mm -hmm. and then use my turnaround that way. So I do use it literally. And sometimes I don't use it as literal and it's just in my head. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in my head, if it's the wrong client and it's like, yes, you think you know it all. And (laughs) (laughs) it's funny though. I've never heard yes and as a verb. So when you said your clients have been yes anding around the office, mm-hmm. that made me chuckle a little bit. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It it really is. Especially when I do this with, with military recruiters, they especially 
Because I, when I, I didn't know how they would take to it. And then once I introduced the concept of it, it's just always a hit. And it, it's always such an aha for them. Like, oh, because there's a lot of learnings that come out of it, right? The yes and literal exercise is about helping you communicate better, meaning active listening. Because the next part of the, there's, it's a three-step framework. I've got to communicate, validate, collaborate. So communicate is listen with eyes and ears. Validate is repeating back what you heard them say. Oh, this, you feel like this is too expensive. And then the and is the turnaround to it all of, okay, and if we did this, if this, then what? Right now we're just trying to build something together until we can all get on the same page Mm -hmm. and get excited about it. So when you actually literally replace the word, but with and, people will lean in like, oh, we're going to do this together. Because you're not refuting my fears, my objections. Like you're not shutting me down. And I'm like, I don't know. Let's think this out. Like, what if we did this? Right. That's an and. And now they're like, I'm bored with you because they, you validated them. The big piece of this is the validation. Huge. It's huge. My wife told me this a long time ago before she was my wife. And she's like, just people have a basic human need to be validated. So whenever you approach a person, a relationship, a conversation, anything like that, and this is what I'm building on what she told me from years ago. She's like, think about whether or not you're validating them or refuting them. And it's a great way to avoid arguments. It's a great way to build rapport. It's a great way to use active listening and empathy to enhance that connection. Gina, I see where you're going with that. And a lot of people feel that way. But what they miss is this concept over here. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to argue with your premise. I'm not going to call you ignorant, even though that's what I essentially called them. But this is the bigger picture. Yeah. And so I'm going to validate you and where you're coming from. Right. And then I'm going to show you something different, which is far different than shut up, stupid. You missed the whole point, right? <laughs> Which is what a lot of salespeople want are thinking inside. In there, right, right. Or at least that is that is your mindset. And if you pay attention, if you're listening at home, if you pay attention to any time you're in an argument and you go back and you replay that argument in your head, some part of your inner monologue was saying, shut up, stupid. You're missing the whole point. And if you just like shut up and stupid or two words that we don't use around this house really ever since we had kids like shut up it's funny you see all the memes on instagram and everything too like, <laughs> daddy i'm gonna say a swear shut up <laughs> like, it's, it's kind of funny but like that is your inner monologue when you're arguing with somebody yeah. and if you can remove that if you can look for okay i see what you're saying or i see what you're seeing but it's not the whole picture and all of a sudden, those discussions turn around. And that's well, yeah. You, one you, of the reasons I think I'm good in adversarial conversations. Um, like, I have a friend. <laughs> go ahead, Gina. No, I was going to say, what? no, likewise. Go ahead. I had a friend that I was working with. I got to remember exactly how he said it. But he said something to the extent of, he's like, I don't know how you get away with it. He says something for, you can tell a lot of people they're wrong. And for some reason, they still like you. He's like, that is, <laughs> that's hard to do, Jeff. And I took it as a compliment. I, I know that's what it was. This is a guy who didn't pass along compliments very often, but he's like, man, you got a, a knack for telling people things that they don't want to hear and walking away and they still have a smile on their face. And yeah, I think it comes down to that concept of validating people. Well, Make them I, feel good about where they are and then show them something different if that's yeah. the case. Well, going back to the whole yes and concept and mythology, because what you're hitting on is that that inner monologue, right? Even though you're having the inner monologue, and I try to stress this, people can still feel what you're thinking mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. don't and you don't realize it. So the inner monologue could show up. And what the yes and concept does, because it's also like a, a philosophy plus a mythology, it's a dual role. If you stay in the mindset of pure acceptance of others then it actually changes how you show up, right? So for example, I might not agree with something that you say. I know we we had this on a podcast. That's why I was saying you're the more compassionate person. And the pitches that we get on LinkedIn, I'm like, and you're like, no, I'm going to talk. And I'm like, no, I don't got patience for that. If we stay in a place of like acceptance that I'm going to be patient and accepting 
of the things that you say and do, even if I totally disagree with you. And I'm like, okay, you're going to start to feel it. But I'm also going to approach it in a way that is pure and loving and with good intention, even if I don't agree with you. And so that shapes everything I do, having that attitude. It's an acceptance attitude versus mm-hmm. an agreement attitude. This is somewhere it's why some people get confused on the yes and they're like, we can't agree to, we can't say yes to everything. I'm like, no, you can't like literally say yes to everything. You can use the word yes, though, because people will lean in when they hear the word yes, because we say the word no four times more than we say mm-hmm. the word yes. And the more that we say yes, we show up more positively. And then that ends up kind of knocking out the inner voice, right? The inner voice is like, that's so stupid. I typically, I would say 95% of the time, I don't have that, that's so stupid inner voice going on. My inner voice is like, they are really struggling with this concept. And I'm curious as to why. I'm curious as to what's going on. I'm curious as to what's deeper. Going back Mm -hmm. to what you're talking about, curiosity. I stay in such a curious place all the time because I'm just curious about people. Yeah. And you don't get into very many arguments because of that. Correct. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, so that, and then I demonstrate that when we do the yes and. So when I demonstrate it first in training, I purposely, I'm like, hey, can I get, can somebody come up here? I need a volunteer because we're going to demonstrate the exercise before everybody does it. And somebody, somebody on the training, on the team with the client comes up and I'm like, Jeff, we're just going to do this yes and back and forth. And it's got nothing to do with nothing. You don't got to worry about it. Just say the first thing that comes to your mind. But I always get to a point where I'm like, I'm hungry. Yes, you're hungry. And I'm hungry too. Yes, you're hungry too. And you're taking me out to dinner tonight, Jeff. And then (laughs) Jeff's got to be like, yeah, I'm taking you out to dinner tonight. And we're, I got to tell my wife, right? Like, cause they're like, they're so (laughs) stuck in their head in the exercise. I'm like, Yes, you got to tell your wife and you're buying. I love that you said getting stuck in your own head because that is probably the best way to describe what I was trying to describe before about expectations and things like that. The expectation is that you are going to have a very strict and rigid three call process to close, et cetera. Get that out of your head and be where you are. Yeah. Right. Be willing to play around a little bit. Be willing to explore. Be willing to be curious. Be willing to see what's really going on. It's not a secret to your prospect that they're in a sales call. Hello. Hmm. There's not some mystery that you're going to unveil at the end when you offer them the perfect solution for their problem. It's relax. If you can't have fun with this, you're doing it wrong. And the chances are you're blocking your own fun because you're trying to stay too rigid in a script or something. Have some fun, do it your way, and be amazed at how much more successful you're going to be, how many more deals you're going to close. You're going to close, you're going to open more opportunities, you're going to close a higher percentage of them. That's how it works. It's science. It's science and it's art. Yeah. It's the combination of the two. It and you, again, a couple of days ago, I saw you post something. I don't know, it was a couple of days. I was stalking your LinkedIn. And I was, in case we had nothing to talk about, I'm like, <laughs> right. I'm like let me go pull his recent, because I, I do get the emails through LinkedIn when you post something. Mm-hmm. So now I totally, for, oh, the writing it out. So you talked about writing yeah. it out, writing out the process and how, and you run into this and I run into this. I am always amazed. And I have clients I'm working with right now that are like, can you just write out our sales process? And I'm like, how do you not know your sales process? I'm like, oh, like this deal that I'm working on right now started out this really huge deal and became a smaller deal. And then they're like, can you just create our sales process for us? And I'm like, what I would like to do is actually is create the sales process with you. I'm like, yes, I can write it for you. I'm like, but you know your business. I don't. So Mm -hmm. what if, and there were a number of things going on with that. They wanted consulting and coaching and training and all these things for one of their one of their employees that they're trying to promote but doesn't have the skill set yet and then they came back with oh we can't spend all this money can we do something smaller where you write you do this consulting for us and i said here's my concern because they got that other person involved that i would be coaching i said and we had we really hit it off and it's great 
like great connection. And he bought into the whole process of being coached. And I said, I think you're going to disappoint this person that now you're going to bring me in and you've kind of pushed him out and he's already feeling kind of on an island. I said, so I don't think it's a good idea. I can do this with you, but he's got to be part of the process with me. And she goes, you're so right. Great. So that's what we're doing. We're going to do it together because it's their business. Right. Right. I'm going to help them lay that process out, period. Right. So again, going back to the flexing of it, right, you need to have the process. But you can't, like you just said, be stuck in your head with like, I got to do this and I got to do this. Guess what? Steps one through three might not even happen on that first call. It might just be a conversation and then we have a second call where we get to the process and that's okay. That's my opinion. Yeah. Well, I like the process as a training guide because, and I've been doing this recently where I've been installing sales processes and auditing sales processes for my clients. And it's always a collaborative exercise of, okay, so what do you, how, I know what has to be done, right? So, okay, so how are you guys accomplishing this? whether it's your prospecting step or it's your early discovery. And, and typically the sales process starts, it really starts with prospecting, but pro all the top of funnel stuff is I think separate from, okay, now we have an engaged listener, right? We have the attention of our people and this middle funnel kind of scenario. How do you, what are you getting in discovery? What are you looking for? What happens when they give it to you? What happens when they don't give it to you? Like all of these things. And so the process of working with the executives to determine what needs to happen in the sales process, but then taking that after it's been built 85% of the way there and saying, okay, in reality now, sellers, what goes on here? And we'll take it a step at a time. And it probably takes four or five meetings, maybe six meetings over six weeks with your, with mm -hmm. your team to just sit there and talk about it. And I think that is more beneficial than just running through training modules and things like that, because you're requiring salespeople yeah. to think on their feet and you're requiring salespeople, you're not requiring, you're enabling salespeople to sit in a room together and talk about selling from a theoretical aspect, as well as a practical aspect yeah. with the context of having recent and former deals in your brain and saying, okay, but well, what happens when this happens? Okay, great. Then how do we document it? And how do we make sure it gets into the CRM properly? And how do we make sure that all these things? And it's just such a th great theoretical practice that involves role play. It involves improv if you wanted to. It involves every step along the way. I think as a sales team, depending on how often you're hiring, you should probably run through this six-week exercise twice a year, maybe yeah. quarterly if you're hiring a lot more often. It doesn't have to take that long. Sounds like a great product. Could be. <laughs> Look at that. My wheels, my wheels were turning right before I started. I was like, wait a second. Hmm. Just, I'm glad Jean is recording this. So that's a really <laughs> good idea. You should, this could be a quarterly plan. Could be. That Jeff could roll out for you or me. It could be. Or, or either, either one. one. Either one. Yeah. Ideas are good. I give them away. Just me too. I, me too. Doesn't me do too. me any good to, I'm not going to corner the market on sales process, augmentation and implementation. I just think that I bring something unique to the discussion and so do you. So. I, and I think that's really, that, that's important. I think we all have to realize what is that, what is the thing that makes you different as a salesperson without being too cliche on like the niching down and things like that. But I think when you know what makes you unique that also helps people want to work with you like i now know what my differentiators are and why you should work with me i know what i'm not as well right because there are mm -hmm. things i'm not great at so if you ask me i'll tell you i'm not great at that but here's what i am great at i know we got to wrap up and yeah, coffee me too my coffee is now cold <laughs> and i have a keurig in my office uh, but it seems so far away they're noisy they are. They are noisy. I'm actually taking it to my theater because we need a Keurig at the theater now. To keep everybody caffeinated during improv on Saturday mornings. Mm -hmm. So I want to give you this parting story. I started to tell you about the toaster. Yes. Oh, yeah. Call okay. back. Call like back. Call back. 
Thank you. So the toaster is a, a significant symbol to me. Over the years, I thought the toaster should be like part of my personal brand logo. But there's two toaster stories. But this toaster story has to do with that bank I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So there was a point years ago where I did need to move to another bank. And I think it's because, I don't know if that bank was being acquired or closing down, or I just, was, I don't know. I, it was time for me to leave that bank. Sure. And so I put out a call on Facebook in my community. Hey, who looking for recommendations of a bank for business banking? Right. And then, of course, everybody's like, all right. And so everyone's putting in their two cents of which bank to go to and why they love their bank, which was fascinating to see all of that. And one of the banks was actually the woman who responded was my original banker at my original bank. And I had met her through a leadership program in Myrtle Beach. And then she had left that bank. Yada, yada. So she responded, oh, you need to come over to our bank. Now, I already had this relationship with her, knew her. She helped me launch my business in Myrtle Beach in 2008. And so then I said, okay, so there's a lot of you that sound like really good banks. Which bank is giving away toasters? I'm like, I am going to base my decision on toasters. Because back in the day, remember, you like you opened an account and you got yep. a thing? And I'm like, yep. so I wanted to see what the reaction was to that. And so that woman in particular said, if you open your, if you bring your accounts to us, we will get you a toaster. So I took my business to them, got all my accounts transferred over. Two weeks later, a toaster showed up at my house. Wow. Kid you not. It was brilliant because then, of course, they knew I would talk about it. Then I posted a picture of the toaster on social media and talked about, right, they listened is the point. So that's my running joke on the toaster story. Now, that links back to being raised working in a flea market and my father selling everything under the sun, including old toasters. And the guy who tried to buy a toaster from him and tried to haggle with him over the $5 price for the toaster and my dad wouldn't budge on the pricing and the guy you know, kept haggling and then he left and then he came back and he's like, all right, I'll take the toaster for $5. And my dad said, it's 10. <laughs> and you I told me that story once before. Yeah. I, <laughs> I forgot it was a toaster though. That's so beautiful. <laughs> So that's always my go-to is, right, because I learned so many lessons from that, but I was mortified as a child. But it's, again, about supply and demand. It's about, like, my dad realized that the toaster was actually worth more than $5. Okay. Was it worth more than $5 or was it just worth an extra $5 on the price to see that guy's face? Because that sounds like your dad just driving a point home. It sounds like my dad driving a hard point home, although I don't think he would do it. That is, um, it's like, it's 10. And just, I can see, I can imagine the blank stare uh, just <laughs> darts right through this guy, stone faced. I don't even, I can't even imagine what was said next. I could just, but I, what I can also see is the slumped shouldered gentleman walking out of the flea market without a toaster. <laughs> Pretty much, I think it was my dad's stubbornness. Mm -hmm. I think that's really what it was. But I like to break down what's the value, like what's the sales story there. And there, mm -hmm. I think maybe in his subconscious, there might have been some of the, oh, it's the only toaster here. It's the only toaster available. Oh, he went, he walked around. He didn't want to take my toaster when I had it. It was there. It was valuable. But he put his nose up and he went and he shopped around and he came back. Now he wants my toaster. And guess what? I'm not going to give him the toaster. Because right. he didn't take it when he could have taken it. So I think yeah. there was a lot, there was pride there. But I think subconsciously, he's like, this toaster's worth more than $5, buddy. Pride is not the emotion that I would first associate with that. <laughs> he was a tough guy. He didn't like that guy and he wasn't going to sell him the toaster. <laughs> I, and if he came back with 10, he would have said 20. I think there's a lesson to be learned yeah. there too, right? I like. Agree. Right. Like you're not the ideal customer for my toaster. I don't want you having my toaster. I don't want you using my toaster. Go find another toaster. But as a matter of fact, get a toaster oven. You're not even a toaster guy. And go do something else, too. That's 
I'll show. I'll tell you what you can do with this toaster. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, even though I uh, I had ideas for us today, it never works that way. It actually works better, as always. I do need to let you know that David Newman is vying for a fractional co-host position. We're going to come up with a different title for him because you're fractional. I don't know what we're going to call him. Well, listen, David's a fun guy. I know you two had fun together. And I can see why you would want to have fun with him more often. So right, that's fine. If David wants to encroach on my turf, then um, <laughs> we can have a conversation about that. <laughs> Fractional co-host turf wars. Okay. <laughs> okay. I like it. Well, my friend, it's always fun with you. Yes. Um, it's happening. always unexpected. We didn't even get to get into the sex coach conversation, but that's okay. You can listen. No, that's you really okay. You can listen to that episode and maybe you'll have commentary later on it. I think that, I don't know. This show comes out. I'm not sure which one comes out first. This one or the or the sex one. Anyway. You'll enjoy it. All right. I will, our, my, our producer, Ian, will put this in the show notes. But where can people find you just so they can hear it? JeffBajoric.com or on LinkedIn, or if you're listening to this on a podcast player, or if you're watching this on YouTube, go to my channel and search Rethink the Way You Sell, and you'll get the Rethink the Way You Sell podcast. You go to my YouTube channel, you'll find the Rethink the Way You Sell podcast. I'm working on another cool project for YouTube that I should be able to announce Ooh. next time mm -hmm. we get together. But I'd like Fantastic. to formally campaign with, the, with your sex therapist client, not client, but a guest in mind, we should campaign for yes anding to be a euphemism to use for adult time. So oh, my oh. wife and I were yes anding the other day, right? Like that kind of a, uh -huh. that kind of a thing. That's what I'm going to, I think that's the right play here. It just ties everything together. Okay. Improv. I like uh, it. You know, I your, like your, it. Your sex therapy practice, all that stuff. Cause that's the, your next phase of your business, right? You, you never know. <laughs> You never know what can happen with me. Everything is a big <laughs> yes and. So. Oh, really? In the. <laughs> <laughs> I see you started using it already. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> right. Well, yes and to much. you. Yes and to you. <laughs> uh, all right, we gotta go. I got another podcast to roll through this morning, so. Always a pleasure with you. Thank you, listeners, for listening to Women Your Mother Warns You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy and Sales Gravy University. Go check out salesgravy.university for all the most amazing courses. We're close to 300 courses now. I've lost track. Wow. So, yeah, it's growing constantly, adding to the catalog. So, go check that out and check out this show on YouTube if you're listening and not watching, because watching our faces, there is nothing better than watching the two of our faces oh. together. Check it out, womenyourmotherwarnsyouabout.com. We'll see you next time. Uh. There's nothing quite like watching our two faces when we're together. It's just devolving <laughs> fast, Gina. <laughs>